somebody asked me yesterday in the comments how much would the car weigh um, or how much would the body weigh I guess both uh, it's an interesting question I was wondering that myself yesterday when I was messing around with the body and actually having to lift it up and down um, you can see I've got the parts of it over there now I'm just clamping the, uh, the bottom of the tail in place um, that's one thing if you know anybody who's into woodwork or metalwork and you don't know what to buy them buy them more more clamps because you never have enough uh, they're very very handy and you can always use more of them but uh, those are sitting there I suppose I could weigh what those are at the moment I could just um, stand on the scales and, and hold them and see what they are but in order to figure out how heavy the car itself is the proper way to do this of course is with um, proper racing corner scales I don't have any of those and they're really expensive to buy just for doing one-off type things um, what most people do is when the car is finished of course you can take it to the local to the local tip and they'll actually weigh a car for you because they're obviously weighing trailers and things going in and out of the tip so they know how much to charge people and for a, a nominal charge they'll weigh a car and they'll give you a printout but an approximate way to do it and I know this isn't the correct way to do it and it's all a bit fiddly um, but this will give me a good approximation what you do is you use normal bathroom scales and if you're really lucky you can get scales that go up to 200 kg or something like that which is good for a light car um, I did this before on my Austin 7 and I was able to put the wheels directly on the scales but the Riley is a bit heavier so I had to use um, leverage basically so instead of having the wheel weight directly on the scale I've got it on a effectively a piece of wood it's pivoted at this end on a piece of, of nut brake fencing wire um, and the wheel is in the halfway point and the end is sitting on the scale so that gives me a, a two to one ratio um, so I can set the car down the car has to be level so it needs to be on level ground um, I probably shouldn't be doing it on top of a giant rug but all of the wheels are on top of the rug so any errors there should cancel out and you need the car level so I have each of the other wheels up on a small block which approximates the height of my my scales um, again it's all very approximate uh, I just grabbed a piece of wood that was more or less the right height and used that but you can see the there's no weight on the jack at the moment and I'm reading it's about 95 kg um, so that's 100 uh, so it'll be double that so 180 um, which seems a lot I don't know how accurate this method is uh, even if it's not accurate it will give me a an accurate reading of the ratio of the weights which is important as well so you know what the balance is um, so this is just the first one I've done what I'll do is I'll swap things around and I'll do the other side and then I'll do the rear uh, and see what sort of total weights I end up with uh, let's see where did I get up to uh, I think this morning I was talking about measuring the weight of the car and I did do that in the end and these were sort of the numbers I came up with uh, it's about 95 kg at the front 95 97 um, and uh, sorry 190 um, and 194 each front wheel and 140 on each rear wheel which kind of makes sense uh, because obviously at the moment all the weight is in the front here so the engine the gearbox they're all past halfway on the car and they're, they're in the front half of the car um, that's where all the heavy stuff is at the moment you have got the torque tube and the rear axle at the back of course but other than that not a lot else at the moment so the total weight at the moment and this is without the body on it 
is 664 kg. I did weigh just this front section of the frame, so just this timber work here is about 7 kg. I didn't weigh the rear because I had a whole bunch of clamps on it still holding the, the, the rear, the bottom wooden pieces of the tail in place. So I'm not sure what that weighs yet, that'll be a bit heavier of course because there's a bit more timber in it. Uh, it's not finished yet, but I have made progress. I uh, have attached a crossbeam. So I've been looking at pictures of original cars again, I always go back to my photos and they do vary a bit. Um, there's different body styles, different original body styles, plus then all the replicas and the rebuild cars and um, different, different styles. But I think on the originals there was normally a beam across the front and then another one across the back. And a friend of mine pointed out to me, it looks like I might not have enough space here to fit a spare tire. And that's actually true because I early on decided I wasn't going to carry one. Um, same in my Austin 7, even my MGB, I've just never carried spares in them. I think uh, I've only ever needed a spare tire once. That's in my whole driving life, um, you know, which is 30 odd years. And the one time I needed it, I couldn't use it because the, the spare was fine, but I couldn't get the wheels off the car because they'd been done up at a garage who had used a, some sort of impact wrench or an air, an air driver and the nuts were too, too tight for me to break loose. So I didn't even get to use the spare in that instance. So like I say, I just never carry one. Um, it's also a lot of weight. Uh, I can't remember what one of these wheels weighs, I'd have to weigh it, but they're not light. So also with the, with the wheel there, you've just got no space in the boot. So that's why I was able to take a few shortcuts. So on mine, you can see these pieces are flush with the inside of the, the timber on top of the chassis rail. On the originals, these are actually thinner. Um, they're either thinner or they're slightly curved. It's hard to tell from the photos, but you get more space in there like that. And you can tell that because the, the metal bracket that goes around here has a little step on it where it steps out to meet the bottom rail. Um, I've done mine differently, so I can just do a simple flat strap all the way around to reinforce it. So no spare tire. Um, I've put one cross piece to um, strengthen across the top and that also ensures these tops, are, um, that these side pieces aren't pulling in. It's, it's holding them apart. There was a little bit of tension there. Uh, there's obviously a little bit of twist in the wood, so I did have to pull those apart just a fraction to get that to line up exactly where it should. And uh, things aren't looking too bad. So I've got my string lines in place, and you can see there is a slight difference on either side of the car. Uh, if I can find some sort of measuring device. This will do. Everything's covered in glue. Uh, so this string line, I have measured the verticals are correct. And I used the line so that I could trace out around these uprights where I need to trim them on an angle so that the, the top rail can fit on there. But if we look at this, it's just under an inch there just over an inch there, about an inch and a quarter. But on this side, it's about half an inch. And yeah, about half an inch. So I am slightly out. Uh, so far that's really the only not quite straight thing on the car. Um, and that's, that's not bad, that's actually pretty good. Um, the other difference, uh, the other reason that could be a little bit different is because I am measuring off the inside edge of these hoops, um, which isn't cut necessarily as accurately as the outside. It's the outside that matters because that's where the skin goes. So maybe if I put my string on the outside, it'll change a little bit. But 
I don't think it should make much difference because these are pretty uniform. Um, I did just leave everything rough sawn more or less. I didn't bother trying to smooth anything out. So that's not too bad, I think. That won't be noticeable on a car. Um, you know, that sort of difference. That'll be fine. And you can see, oh, maybe, I've got a center line on that, and that does line up. So the center looks good. Uh, I think my wooden beam in the center there doesn't actually line up. It's, it's a little bit that way. But again, that shouldn't really matter. Um, I can adjust that on the, the body. It's a bit hard to tell. But for an old car, it's straight enough. Uh, the string line let me get the angle on these faces and then I just sort of transferred that around so that it's level and to do that I used my bendy steel ruler and just clamp that where it needs to go and the good thing about doing that is you also get to put a level across it to make sure that it is level sort of that way um, which is which is fine uh, the other thing is to, before I before I checked that everything was level, I made sure all the tires were up to the correct pressure as well. Because obviously I've got it sitting on the ground on its tires. If one tire was flat, then you know the body wouldn't be sitting flat. So I checked all that. Um, I actually checked all that before I measured the weight. But again, for these old cars, it's close enough. I, I'm pretty sure if you measure any body, original body, they're going to be completely wonky all over the place. So I'm pretty happy with how that's coming out so far. Uh, so yes, the trim those, then make those pieces that go in there. And there's one more hoop to make, which is the boot opening, and it goes sort of in here. It's not in line with this, it's actually offset. Which is good, because it means I can screw that top rail down into these, and screw the other one from this side going up. Uh, somebody mentioned in the comments about the wood splitting and about drilling pilot holes for all the screws. Yes, I have been doing that. Uh, the reason it's split is uh, one of the... I, I, sometimes I, I get the holes a bit too close to the edge. So these are just nail holes, but if you, if you get the screw too close to the edge, it's, it's more likely to split. They say you shouldn't screw into the end grain, uh, but there's no way to avoid it, really. And the other thing I should mention about the screws is I only drill the I drill a pilot hole for where the screw goes into the, the lower piece of timber. On the top, you actually drill effectively a clearance hole for where the shank of the screw goes. So, look at a screw. Um, so I drill a pilot hole for where the thread goes, and then this hole I drill bigger. So it's not a tight fit. And that's so that the, the screw isn't binding up on the timber, and it's actually pulling it down to clamp it. Uh, that's what the screws are doing. They're, they're clamping everything together till the glue dries. And that's how it was done originally, which sort of takes me over to the books. Um, this is the little thing I'm going to build my router foot switch with. I'm going to replace that cable with a decent mains powered one. Um, but this has got an RCD in it. This is something a, a, my friend Mike gave me actually. Uh, so it'll be good to finally use that. But I'll make sort of an extension cable thing out of this with a foot switch on it. Uh, which will be quite handy for some other things. But uh, uh, yes. Uh, proper hydration is important when it's hot. I have a, a drink bottle out here usually with cold water in it. I have to be really careful that I pick up the right thing and drink from it because I've got bottles of linseed oil and wax and grease remover and acetone and things like that so you have to be careful. Um, this is a pint of gin and tonic because it's it's 10 to 5 so I think the bar's open now. Uh, books. So I did look for try to find as much information as I could about how you actually do coach building and there really isn't a lot of information out there you you, you get books 
that describe it and they talk about it and they describe it as a lost art. And those books don't help because they don't explain the art at all. They just talk about coach building. Um, what's better are some of these older books. So this one briefly mentions timber frame body. It's more about steel body and um, steel and fiberglass. And I think when this book came out, fiberglass was kind of new. So this does have a little bit about a timber frame body, fiberglass. Um, but it doesn't really describe it that well. So, I mean, it, it's, it's quite similar to a Morgan, I think, the sort of shape. Uh, but it doesn't really describe exactly how to do things. It talks about using oak for the bottom rail that sits on the chassis and then ash for everything else um, because you need it to flex. The, it, it, it just doesn't really, doesn't really say a lot at all. Um, so that book's interesting, but it wasn't particularly helpful. I got this book online. Um, this is one of the, the sort of modern ones. You know, it sort of says it's buying, building, restoring and maintaining, but no, it isn't. So oh, I think I've got a spider on it. Sorry. Um, I sprayed the outside of the shed and we sprayed the outside of the house with stuff that, um, yeah, there he goes, stuff that gets rid of spiders. Uh, it doesn't kill them, they just don't like it, so they move. Which, after I sprayed it on the outside of the shed, I realized where they were going to move to. And that's basically to the inside of the shed. So there's spiders everywhere at the moment. Just little ones. Uh, they don't seem to do any harm, they catch the flies, so that's good. But anyway, uh, back to this book. It, it's not very helpful. It doesn't really explain things that well. It does a little bit, but it didn't really help me. Uh, I mean, maybe you could cons consider it inspiring. It, it's, it's kind of like a lot of these modern books where they're, they're books for people who are vaguely interested, but probably not actually going to try it themselves. Um, it's just not quite enough information in there. And I'm not sure if it's this book or another one I've got where I may have another one. Uh, and it's got different people talking about how they do it. And they all do it in completely different ways. So again, not really much help. The book you need and you have to get if you're going to do this and you want to know how to do it properly is this book because this is a proper period book. Um, so, Motor Bodywork, Herbert J. Butler, with a forward by Sir Her Herbert Austin. So you know it's good. Uh, 1924. And this book is excellent. And it goes into all the different styles of bodywork, and it even has drawings for them. And this book, again, it, it, some of the details, it doesn't go into a huge amount, but it does go into enough. So, for example, this is the section where it talks about how you glue and screw the, the timber together. Uh, they're talking about using white lead as the, as the glue, uh, which is actually a paint. And they even mention that here, that, that new glues are now available that resist the wet to some degree. Um, and they give greater adhesive value than any paint. So that sort of shows how old this book is. But this is um, where it mentions drilling the clearance hole for the top piece of timber and only threading into the bottom piece because that's what pulls them together. So that's where I got that sort of information from. Uh, this book is really fascinating. It goes into all the trim all the period correct stuff, um, sheet metal working, don't know if it mentions wheeling, but uh, excellent, excellent book, so 
if you do want a book about actual coach building uh, and not sort of a modern one that vaguely goes into it um, this is the one to get so I think that's where I'm at today uh, tomorrow I will trim those tops and make those those pieces that go in there and also hopefully the piece that goes over the top and I think I've got I've got one one full plank left which should be enough to do that but I'm not sure it's actually going to be enough to um, to do the doors so I will probably have to get more uh, so yeah another good day's work I think the the weight of the car so 664 kg for the chassis uh, the the total weight of a Brooklyn's is usually given as around uh, I think for the road going cars it was about 800 kg I believe the, the racing ones were lighter um, obviously uh, so I'm assuming the 800 kg is with guards and uh, all the different bits and pieces uh, and also this is full of fluids as well so obviously not fuel there's no fuel tank but it should be close to that I'm guessing The other thing I should mention is the amount of time I've just been cleaning up. So to get a lot of these bits of timber straight, I've been planing the edges. So for example, that I just planed all the edges of that. I don't bother showing any of that sort of stuff. Uh, but of course it makes a mess everywhere. So you end up with wood shavings and sawdust all over the place. So I spend an awful lot of time cleaning up. Uh, I get glue everywhere because obviously I'm using loads and loads of glue. I'm not sure how much is left in this bottle. Still feels pretty full. Uh, so there's always mess to clean up. Uh, you can see the state of that. It'd be familiar to teenage boys everywhere. But yeah, lots of mess, lots of cleaning up. I still haven't quite figured out the best way to do this dust extraction. It's all still very temporary at the moment. I had to shorten that hose because I was getting so much suction on it, it was actually collapsing the hose, it was flattening it over. Uh, that now helps. I don't know how you're supposed to do it on these band saws. Uh, there isn't really a convenient place to pick up the dust, so I've just sort of got this sitting underneath here at the moment, held on with a, a microwave oven um, magnetron magnet is holding it in place. So. I don't know how you would normally do it. I don't know if there's a way you would you would suck it out of here or how, how does it normally work on these sort of saws? Maybe this one's just too small to, to worry about extraction, but that definitely makes a big difference. Um, it would just be dust everywhere if I didn't have that. There is still dust everywhere, but it would be a lot worse. I do wear a mask as well um, while I'm doing all of this just to uh, to make sure I'm really not breathing in anything, anything nasty. Oh, I remembered something else as well. Uh, when I was looking at the, the measuring the weights, I've looked at all of that before using the, uh, the bathroom scales. That's, that's a well-known cheap way of doing it. And it works well enough. Um, people will say, you know, why don't you take the car to the, uh, the weigh station or the tip and get it weighed there it's like well yeah i could but i'd have to take it on a trailer and i don't have one and it's it's a trip so it's easier to do it do do something approximate in your own shed than have to take the car somewhere but uh there's a channel super fast matt he does quite a few interesting little projects and in one of those he built a a weighing device um using uh moving dolly with load cells uh, so the casters are bolted on via load cells which gives him the weight measurement as he jacks the car up which is quite a cool way of doing it but I did think there might be another way with a effectively an open wheel car like this um, without the guards in place I was wondering if I can use my my girder there 
and get a um, like a crane gauge. Uh, you know, it's a sort of a sort of gauge that you you hang off the chain, and you use it to lift things up. So would it work if you used one of those and a strap around the top of the wheel, and just lifted enough to get the wheel off the ground? Would that give you an accurate or reasonably accurate corner weight uh, for that corner of the car? So obviously you could go around all four wheels and just lift them off the ground just a little bit, and and measure how much you need to. Uh, you know how much force you need to lift them and get the weight that way don't know if that would work uh, I have to think about that a little bit more probably not after my pint of gin and tonic but this is this is actually a motorbike tire this is my little Kawasaki but you can see it's the same diameter more or less as the car wheel and given that smaller than a car wheel, which, which has to have the hub and everything on it, you can see how little space there is for a spare tire in this thing. And that's why they have the shape of these different in the originals, to make space for it. Um, and that's basically where it would sit. So, like I say, I decided a while ago I'm not going to carry a spare in it. Uh, room's already a problem in this car without filling it, filling it up with something you, you probably almost never have to use, hopefully. So... If I do do any big trips in this car, I will upgrade my my um, AA membership. That's Automobile Association, not Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, to get the the upgraded version, they'll basically tow your car home, or they'll flatbed it home if you ever get stuck anywhere. So I have to get it to the point where it's finished and I can actually drive it and then road trip it somewhere, I guess.